Well, hi again. This is Jan at Learn English with Be Global. And today we're going to learn about how to speak English fluently and confidently. You've heard it said that English is a work in progress. Have fun with it. I, I hope you know that. Uh, English is... Uh, people disagree about how you should speak English, so I hope that you know you don't have to worry about certain uh, parameters in spoken English. Fluency has to do with uh, communicating, okay? Not perfection. So, take a deep breath and relax, and actually we're going to talk today about the circus. Uh, why the circus? Well, I just chose that because it's a fun, short word that will help us grow in our navigation of being confident when we speak English. So, if you want to get out a piece of paper or, or something, write it like, like this, across. These letters will help you remember our main idea. So, what does the first letter stand for? Well, the first letter, C, stands for confidence comes before fluency. Okay? I have up here, fluency does not, does not equal grammatical perfection. Okay? Uh, no one ever said fluency means speaking English perfectly. That's that's not true. It means speaking English with ease. So I want you uh, to um, move toward fluency by gaining confidence, but you've got to have the confidence first. Um, know that there is no native English speaker anywhere that speaks English flawlessly without uh, errors or mistakes. So, the C, confidence, comes before fluency. The I stands for ignoring the grammar police. You know who the grammar police are, right? They're the people that are always correcting you and uh, they, they may even just be in your head. You're like, oh, I, I, I said that wrong or just forget them. Uh, don't worry about those pieces. These people should not stop you from trying uh, hard. They're not, they don't have any power over you. <laughs> okay? So ignore them. Ignore the grammar police. Outside or maybe the ones in your head. So I have been teaching international students for over uh, 20 years in the U.S. Okay? The ones that I remember uh, well are not the ones that spoke English perfectly. They are the ones that tried, that smiled, that had fun, and these are the ones that made a lot of mistakes. But they learned from their mistakes. Or, or maybe they never learned from their mistakes, and it doesn't matter, because they became part of, almost part of our family, because they had such a great attitude and uh, they just kept trying, and they had fun, and they knew it wasn't the end of the world if they didn't say something exactly right. And in fact, I can remember them better because of their attitude. So fight through the fear of making mistakes, okay? Uh, learn to laugh at yourself. I know sometimes that's hard, um, but when we laugh at ourselves, it gives other people permission to correct you and not be afraid uh, that they're going to hurt you. And hopefully they will correct you gently, but if you're like, oh, how do I say that, right? Then they'll say, okay, um, uh, th this is how you should really say this phrase. Uh, so let's go back to the circus. We've got the C. It stands for confidence comes before fluency. All right, so we're trying to talk about confidence here. The I stands for ignore, ignore the grammar police. Just ignore them. Um, 
R stands for recognize what motivates you. All right. Um, why do we try something that's hard, like uh, learning another language? Um, something is motivating us, right? You care enough, if you're motivated enough, to maybe even look a little silly sometimes, then you know your motivation is really high, right? And that is great uh, because uh, once you figure out what you, what you love, then that, will, that motivation will carry you and that hopefully will bloom into English fluency because you're willing to do the daily work of, of learning new things. So it's a big deal. Motivation is a big deal. Recognize what motivates you um, and I can't figure that out for you. Uh, so later on I'm going to be giving you some tips on fluency and maybe you're like hurry up I just want to hear. Uh, if you're not uh, motivated these tips aren't going to matter. So you've got to figure out what motivates you and not just what motivates you today but for uh, the long uh, the long haul as we say the long road. Okay so back to the circus. Circus. Confidence comes before fluency. Okay? Ignore the grammar police. Don't worry about grammar. Don't worry about making mistakes. R, recognize what motivates you. Okay? You're going to need that. And the next C. The next C is to call people who encourage you. Speaking English confidently should really take place in the context of a positive community. And that will improve your confidence because, as I reminded you, confidence comes before fluency. And also, you remember, you need to ignore who? The grammar police, right? Don't be afraid of making mistakes. R, recognize what motivates you. C, call people who encourage you. The U stands for understand that we are all moving at different speeds. If you have had a bad English day, that doesn't define you. All right, remember that. Um, you may need to write that down. We all have bad language days. <laughs> um, but that doesn't define who you are. So don't compare yourself with someone else. Okay? So, final time here at the circus is you gain confidence first before fluency. You ignore the grammar police. Recognize uh, what motivates you. Call people who encourage you. Understand uh, that we're all starting at, at, at different places. We're all going at different speeds. It's okay. The S is start small. You gain confidence by starting small, right? Set little goals and then these little accomplishments, they build on each other, right? That happens for everything we do, uh, especially for language learners. So on to our fluency tips. Number one, set a time to practice every day. If you set this time, you will turn it into a habit and that will be something that you go to and you know that you will be practicing English every day. But before we jump into the rest of these tips, I want you to think about how you learn. Because really, uh, if you try these tips that I'm going to give you uh, and you don't know how you learn best, it's going to be more frustrating. Uh, so for brevity's sake, let's just talk briefly about four different kinds of learners, okay? So we have the visual, the auditory, the kinesthetic, the doer, and the reading and writing learner. So think about 
which one you might be most naturally. You may be a lot of these and probably are, but uh, if you think about whether you're visual, auditory, kinesthetic, or reading and writing, as we go through the rest of these tips, that will help you increase your fluency, hopefully uh, to speed up your fluency. Well, so you've already set a time to practice every day, right? So what are you going to do during this practice time? Well, I suggest that you practice your English 15 minutes every day. Some kind of short phrase, and maybe you can pick that out from a, from a good book, a grammar book, or some book that has the, the correct way to say it. So practicing that phrase um, will, be, will be good for you. And just doing 15 minutes uh, is just a small, reasonable goal, all right? It's, um, it's like the S in circus we talked about, starting small, and you can do 15 minutes a day. Well, what's practicing a phrase 15 minutes a day going to look like for you? How can we get that discipline to move from your brain to actual conversation? Well, if you're a visual learner, you may need to find a phrase that you can see as a picture or, or a movie, TV, something like that. Some, some picture that represents what that phrase looks like and practice the phrase while you're looking at that so it can, it can stick in your mind longer, okay? If you're an auditory learner, if you like to learn, uh, or if you're, it's easier for you to learn just to listen, just listen to something, you could talk about that phrase um, to someone else. You could also listen to a short um, audio uh, lecture about that phrase while you're going to school or while you're working out. Uh, you could also just record your, your voice saying that phrase over and over and listen to it. And that could be how you spend that, that 15 minutes. Uh, are you a reading and writing learner? Well, experts will say that you probably work best in quiet areas. And you do well to write out that phrase several times. Um, eventually you're going to need to say the phrase, um, and we will get to that, but uh, when you write it out, that will be helpful for you. You uh, probably enjoy flashcards, and those will be great uh, for your style of learning. Uh, if you are a kinesthetic learner, that means you like to do things or feel things, those flashcards, if you write them out uh, and you have those, make those into a game. Uh, make it fun for you um, and you can learn while you're physically doing something. You may even take the phrase and uh, do a dance to it or something. If the phrase is, I like to dance, well, maybe you dance while you do it. Or if you like to cook, uh, or if the phrase is, I like to cook, then um, you can cook while you say the phrase, I like to cook. So, uh, do you see what I mean? Uh, becoming fluent takes work, but if you can link it to some, some way that you, uh, something that you know how to do naturally, that you a way that you learn naturally, then maybe you won't want to give up and you'll keep trying to do that, okay? Okay, tip number three. Find someone with whom you can practice after you've made it your habit to set a time every day to practice and you've decided to practice 15 minutes every day. Find someone with whom to practice. And remember, just go for it. Don't worry about making a mistake. Uh, just keep trying. So the fourth fluency tip 
I have for you is to form your schedule around practicing English. So, what do I mean by that? Well, most people are very busy, right? So, schedule a time of English practice with someone over a meal. Uh, you both have to eat, so just decide that for that one meal, maybe once a week, maybe more times a week, all you're going to do is speak English while you're eating together. I think that's a, a great way to do that. Or, you may find someone who uh, likes to exercise on a regular basis. Most people do. And so if you can just form your schedule around just exercising with that person, whether it be walking or playing some kind of game, and practicing English, only English, while you're doing that, then you're not having to set up this separate time in your schedule uh, to open a book and work on your English. It's just a part of natural life. And so you'll learn some of those skills and increase your fluency. If you have friends who go to church every Sunday or if they are participate in weekly community activities, ask if you can join them. Um, many of my students have told me they improved their English by going to church once a week because at church we read, we speak, we listen, and we sing in English. So you're getting almost all of the learning styles in just a couple hours. Also, they have said uh, the Bible is a great text for proper grammatical English, and so they can count on that if they want to learn how to say something right. That's just a thought. So, number four, form your schedule around practicing English. Tip number five, identify objects in English. What does that mean? It means find a post-it note, write out oven, and put it on your oven. Mirror, put it on your mirror. Identify everything in your house that you can in English. So you are surrounded by English words. When you wake up in the morning, you see them. When you go to bed at night, you see them. And then, once you have become comfortable and you have memorized these nouns, then you can add a verb in front of them. Choose any verb you like. You know, we like our verbs and our nouns together, so you can practice them. So you're immersed in English, and then that will help you begin to start thinking in English, and that also will increase your fluency. Tip number six. Use good media resources like you're doing right now. Use a watch English television or English movies or listen to English music. And choose those media options based upon your goals. And what I mean is if your goal is to be a professional uh, businessman or woman, uh, then choose those media options that have vocabulary related to your career field. And then that will help you in the interview. So think, think that through um, because I don't want you to waste good brain memory on information that is not helpful and might even be confusing to you as you're trying to remember things for a good interview or a, a promotion or something like that. Just a final tip, uh, don't learn profanity in English if it's not going to help you achieve your goal. Uh, save space in your brain for phrases that will help you achieve your ultimate objective. That's just a final thought. Now, the good news for you is that you have already done fluency tip number six by watching this educational English video. And I hope you've learned some more about speaking confidently and fluently 
in English. Thanks for watching. And if you like this video, hit subscribe and leave a comment below. Again, it's Jen at Learn English with Be Global, and today we're going to learn about how to speak English fast. Okay, so how do we go from a normal English phrase to a faster informal contraction? Let's take a sample, okay? A normal English phrase is going to. The faster informal contraction is gonna going to get smashed together, contracted together, turns into gonna, going to, get rid of the T-O, get rid of the G, gonna, going to. Okay, that's how that works. If you listen to popular music, you hear this a lot, gonna, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. Here's a very common example. Taylor Swift was kind enough to sing the song Shake It Off. A big part of her song uses our informal contraction. Because the players gonna play, play, play. And the haters gonna hate, hate, hate. Baby, I'm just gonna shake, 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 shake it off. Right? So, what she's trying to say is the players are going to play. The haters are going to hate, and she's just going to shake it off. And you should too, apparently. So going to turns into gonna. If you know this song, you're already speaking English fast. Good for you. How about another example? Okay, how do we get to wanna? Wanna get some coffee? Well, let's start with the original phrase. Do you want to? That's the normal phrase, right? Then faster, you wanna. So, gotten rid of the do, right? Gotten rid of the do. We'll talk about that. Do you want to? You wanna. And then it goes to wanna, fastest. Wanna. Wanna get something to drink, right? So, the same rule applies, right? If gonna comes from a shortened version of going to, you wanna or wanna comes from a shortened version of do you want to, right? So sometimes English speakers will omit the question word do and just raise their uh, voice at the end of the sentence to signal that it's a question. You wanna, right? You want to go see a movie. That's a shortened version of do you want to go see a movie. Uh, you can also use wanna in the first person. I wanna, right? Uh, I want to get ice cream. That's short for I want to get ice cream. So let's look at a little bit different informal contraction, okay? This one is gimme. Now, the original form of gimme is would you give me, and even more shortened is give me, and then finally the fast way to say it, gimme. If you want help from someone, you might say formally, would you give me a hand, meaning can you give me some help? But the fast way we would say it is, give me a hand, give me some help, right? So normal, would you give me, shorten even more, faster, give me. The fastest, what you will commonly hear, give me, give me. Now, <clears throat> I hope this doesn't happen to you, but if a scary person comes up to you and says, give me your money. 
well, you're being robbed, right? So the robber is not going to say, give me your money. He or she is going to quickly say, give me your money. So another informal contraction we use is digja. Now, what does digja sound like to you? Digja. Well, you're probably guessing, did you, right? It's just a match together form of did you. Uh, we say this quite a bit. Did you know? Did you know? Right? And we, we use the J sound because the D makes it easier to turn this, the U, into a J sound. Just did ya. Okay, so we just kind of drop that Y sound totally. Alright? So we will say, did you know? Or, did you hear that? If you hear something that makes you nervous, you don't say, say slowly, did you hear that? You say, did you hear that? You say it fast, right? So that's what this stands for, did you? Did you hear that? Now, you can also use this, uh, this phrase in the present tense, this shortened version. So, do you? <clears throat> changes to do ya? Do ya? <laughs> uh, so there's no D at the end of this one, so we're able to keep the Y sound. Do ya? Uh, do ya want to talk? We might say that instead of do you want to talk? Do you want to talk? Now there's another phrase that is similar to this, and it is would ya? Can you, can you imagine what would ya is a contraction of? It is would you. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> would you, the D at the end, right, our D here, again, turns the Y sound into a J. So, would ya? Um, would you, would you go to the bank for me? Would you let me borrow your car? Would you let me borrow your car? So, you can see how these will uh, move quickly into just a, a, a whole new word. So, we learned about would ya. Would you like me to come? Short, that's the short form of would you like me to come? Or would you get my phone? Would you give me your phone? Or would you, would you give me my phone? And again, with would ya, you can do the same with the present tense. Will you turns into will ya. Will ya. For example, if you want to know if your friend gets home okay, you can say, will you give me a call when you get home? Will you give me a call? That's shortened for, will you give me a call? Right? So, would ya and will ya. Now the next one we'll look at is whatcha. Whatcha? So, it's in the same kind of area of using the, the word you at the end, right? So, this shortened phrase can incorporate three different verbs. Uh, are, have, and do. Okay? So, we'll start with are. The, the shortened phrase, whatcha, begins with what are you? Okay? Then faster, what are you? What are you? So that can be a shortened phrase as well, an informal contraction. The fastest one you'll hear, though, is whatcha. Whatcha. So, uh, the, the cha comes from the T sound. Do you, do you hear that? Whatcha. So we're just dropping the U, dropping the R, just 
watcha cha you turns into cha okay so what are you going to do what you're going to do what you're going to do then what you're going to do for example you find out your friend failed a class you would say you might say what you going to do in other words what will you do now so, I mentioned that the informal contraction, whatcha, it incorporates three verbs. It can incorporate three verbs, are, do, and have. Now, we looked at are, and now we're going to look at do. So, you start off with the normal phrase, what do you, or what did you. You can use the present tense or the past tense for to ultimately end up with whatcha. So, what do you faster? What you? What you? And then whatcha? Whatcha? So, for example, what do you know becomes what do you know? What you know? What do you know? what you know or, or you can also say what did you say what'd you say what you say what you say I didn't hear you what you say now I would I would really not recommend saying what you say ever to a professor or a boss anyone in authority so what you say save that for your friends okay but so this is an example of using the verb do in the phrase whatcha. Well now let's look at how the verb have is incorporated into the informal contraction whatcha. So the formal way we would say is what have you dot dot dot. The compressed way, the mashed together way, faster, what have you? What have you? What have you? Fastest, what you? Or what? But what I want to tell you is that there are just a couple more phrases that I think you should know. And the phrase we're going to talk about now is gotta. Gotta. So, gotta is like got and two got married, they had a baby and had gotta. We say this all the time. Gotta. Alright? And uh, commercials are always saying, you gotta have this. You gotta have this. Or, you gotta try this. You gotta try this. The formal way to say something like gotta would be, you have got to blank. Okay? Uh, a way that you will hear this a lot is gotta go I gotta go or I gotta run so if someone's in a hurry they don't have time to say I have to go they just say ah, I gotta go I'm late for class or I'm late for work well are you ready for our next two informal contractions they are kinda and sorta now they really mean the same thing. So you're learning two informal contractions that mean the same thing. So this is a good thing. Uh, and again, it is just the combination, kinda, is a combination of kind and of. Kind of. Kinda. Sort of. Sort of. So we drop off the of and put in an A sound. And it's just quicker to say. So, an example might be, uh, well, in the original form, an example might be, I kind of like exercising. Or, I sort of like exercising. But, uh, usually you'll hear someone say, I kind of like exercising. 
I sort of like exercising. You don't hear the of at all in that. And what it's communicating is, I don't totally like exercising, or I don't love exercising. I kind of like it. I sort of like it. I just want to thank you for watching, and if you like this video, hit subscribe and then leave a comment below. It's Jan at Learn English with B Global, and today we're going to learn about secrets to improve your English listening skills. Now, there are many ways to improve your English listening skills, um, and truthfully, with the resources on the internet, most of them are not that secret. But in this video, I'll share what I have gleaned. Uh, to be some of the best ways I think you can improve your English listening skills. So the first way is to mentally prepare to listen. Um, I start with this secret because uh, after I've explained this tip a little bit, uh, you can pause this video, mentally prepare, and then practice it for the rest of the time you're listening. Uh, so how do you mentally prepare to listen to English? Uh, well, generally, you can anticipate what the topic or context of English conversation uh, is going to be before it happens, right? Now, for example, you know this video is going to be about improving your English listening skills, right? Uh, therefore, you can expect to hear some key words. Um, what might be some key words with regard to this topic that you might uh, think about before continuing to listen to this video? Can you think of some? Just simple key words. You're like, when I hear that, I know what they're talking about, right? So maybe one would simply be uh, listening. That's a key word, <laughs> okay? Uh, another one might be, you know, we're talking about secrets. So, write that down on a piece of paper. Secrets. The word secrets. Another one might be speed, okay? Speed. Another one might be accuracy. Uh, context. Okay, so those might be some of the words you could anticipate with this particular topic. Um, so once you've made that list of key words, review them uh, and then start the video again um, and be ready to hear them and be confident that you're miss or that you're not missing, that you're catching the main ideas. Um, when you're prepared to catch the main ideas, then it frees up more of your concentration for the rest of the connecting content. That makes sense, right? So that will help you. You've, you've kind of knocked out the tough, maybe the, well, I don't know about the tough stuff, but the, the big concepts in your mind. You can be ready to hear those. So then... How do you mentally prepare for a conversation? One of those two-way things, right? Of course, that's a bit tougher. However, you can always prepare even a little bit. I think we've all prepared ourselves when we needed to call someone uh, to whom we felt a little shy. Um, we practiced what we would say beforehand. Uh, so even uh, e even in our native language, we wanted to prepare, be prepared to speak to someone else who was in our native language. So this is uh, pretty normal stuff, but it's important. Um, if you need to call someone, for example, uh, consider what questions might come up based on the topic of your conversation. 
If you're able, write out the dialogue. As you're writing it out, you'll likely discover something that you find difficult to express in English. So, when you do that, you are uh, preparing maybe further than you thought for topics or words that may be exchanged in the conversation. You might say writing a dialogue isn't listening. Uh, no, but it really is preparing you to listen and that is so important. Um, I'll tell you, in the U.S., for example, firefighters are held with great respect and honor. And I learned something about them recently. Uh, did you know that firefighters don't spend most of their time fighting fires. You might already know they spend most of their time preparing to fight fires. And that's why they do it well. And that's the same with you. You know, listening is a very important thing to do. Um, you don't do it all the time. Uh, but in order to do it well, you need to prepare. And so this is one of the ways you can uh, do that. You can Create a list of key words that you are anticipating will be a part of that conversation. And so our first secret to learning how to improve your listening skills is to mentally prepare. Well, our second tip, secret, to improving your English listening skills is to focus on what you can understand what you can understand and I have three quick just sub points for this secret uh, if you are listening to someone don't let yourself get distracted by words you don't understand um, I realize you want to understand the whole idea um, but if you don't may I suggest saying to the person, um, can I tell you what I just heard you say? Um, people love to hear what they said. Um, so if you didn't get all of it, they'll usually be happy to fill in the gaps for you. Um, the second sub point is even if the person you're talking to is speaking quickly, um, practice calmly focusing on what you do understand. Don't, don't panic. Um, remember, if you let yourself get too worried, um, you'll have an even harder time understanding. So relaxing, breathing, keeping a good perspective uh, can help fight um, negative and unhelpful distractions. Um, and it can help you achieve your main goal of being a better English listener. Alright, so our third sub-point is to give yourself time to wait for the whole concept to make context to make itself known. So maybe you're in a conversation with several English speakers and you don't understand it at first. Well, Really, eventually the context will reveal itself um, by the key words that we talked about before that are um, repeated and also some phrases that are repeated. So, to review our second secret to improving your English listening skills, it is focus on what you can understand. The three subpoints. Don't get distracted by what you don't understand. Calmly focus on what you do understand. Don't panic. And then C is just wait for the actual context to reveal itself because it will happen. Okay, so our third secret for improving your English listening skills is don't try to do a mental translation into your language while you're listening. What does that, what does that mean? Um, well, when I was preparing for this video, I learned this idea, and I think it's very insightful and worth applying and passing on. Um, 
And I'm going to give you the tip, the exact quote from the English teacher that I heard this from. And he said, if you listen to English and try to translate it into your language at the same time, you're trying to do something that is impossible. Talk about frustrating. Um, our brains just don't work like that. You cannot concentrate on listening to someone and at the same time be translating what he or she is saying into your own language. Uh, when you do this, you're cheating yourself out of the best chance to understand. Now, for example, I'm trying to learn Spanish. And when I read in Spanish, I fight the temptation to mentally transcribe the Spanish I'm reading back into English. Why? Well, because transcribing it back into English is really not necessary for me to understand what I'm reading. Um, and in fact, doing so makes it lose its unique Spanish flavor, which is great. Um, not to mention, though, it slows down my reading considerably. Um, and the same would be true for my listening or for your listening. So. Just try to embrace those English words and um, keep listening. Well, we're on number four of our secrets to improving our English listening skills. Number four is practice listening in English from people with different accents and different voices. And you might be thinking, why would I torture myself like that? Well, I'll give you two super reasons why it's good to practice English from people with various accents. Well, the first reason is there's always going to be differing opinions uh, about which person speaks proper English. So, if you say, shouldn't I just focus on learning how to listen to people who are the proper English speakers. Well, yes, that would be helpful uh, if everybody spoke proper English. Uh, but hardly anyone does. Uh, sorry to tell you. <laughs> Most of the English-speaking world does not speak English the way it is spoken by, uh, for example, international newscasters, these professionally trained people. They're a great foundation, but most people don't really talk like that. So that's the first reason. The, the second reason is um, that you should practice listening to uh, English speakers who have different accents or voices is uh, because most of the English, and again, this was a secret that was I learned, and I'm passing on to you, uh, that uh, more and more non-native English speakers are speaking to other non-native English speakers. Uh, um, so you're going to need to know what that sounds like, not just from uh, one particular English speaking country. So, be a very good use of your time to listen to other non-native English speakers as well. Um, when I worked with internationals at MIT, you might imagine they were from all over the world. And they needed to understand each other's English uh, accent if they were going to complete uh, their experiments in the lab. Uh, that was just as important as understanding what they were doing in the, uh, in the laboratory. Uh, understanding non-native English speakers English accents and what they were saying um, in uh, their their cohort group. Now I, I work with many Chinese students uh, and they struggle with understanding the East Indian English. Um, however, it's a very helpful skill um, that they're going to need to have if they're going to accomplish their goals, maybe their academic goals or even uh, career goals, um, and vice versa. So 
these are really practical things for you to do. Um, not just trying to make it harder on you. Um, if you only, again, if you only listen to one person's uh, um, kind of English, maybe off of an English tape or some English speaker, um, then everybody else that speaks English is going to sound <laughs> like they're speaking a different language when they're really speaking English. And you'll miss out on a lot. Um, also remember that men and women and children say things with different accents um, and voices as well. So don't just <clears throat> practice listening to one gender or age group speak English. You'll really be limiting yourself. Um, some listening uh, tips, listening skills to work on while you're uh, working on this tip is to listen to songs, people singing, uh, not for the grammar, but for their meaning, um, to practice hearing it in different voices and different ways. Um, also, uh, listening to audiobooks, um, podcasts, um, and textbook exercises, uh, many of which are free online. You can practice listening to someone speak quickly and uh, hear what they're saying over and over. That's good. Um, if you watch short English TV shows or even commercials, um, I would recommend the following. So get a show that you can watch over and over. Of course, YouTube is great for this. And then practice listening in this order. First, play the show, but don't look at it. Um, just listen and see what you can understand. Um, write down the main ideas that you're gathering. So the show is in the is behind you. Um, so pretend maybe you're listening to someone on the phone. It's a great practice. So that's the first one. Have the show on, but don't look at it. Just listen. And then watch the show, the same show without subtitles and see what else you can understand. Then, watch it again with English subtitles. Fill in some more of the gaps of what you're um, understanding. And finally, if there are uh, some subtitles that are in your language, watch it in, uh, uh, in, your, in English, but uh, reading your native languages subtitles, the, the words under the screen that are saying what uh, the actors are saying. So, I wish I could be with you to help you with that, uh, but I'm sure you will do great. Well, I hope this video helped you improve your English listening skills. Thanks for watching, and if you like this video, hit subscribe and leave a comment below. It's Jan at Learn English with B Global, and today we're going to learn about eight major word groups in the English language. Now, this may be a brand new topic to some of you, or this may be a good review. Well, why should we learn about word groups? Well, identifying word groups in a sentence. It secures a correct understanding of the meaning of the sentence. For this video, I'm going to use traveling as the context for all of our examples. Because I imagine that since you're trying to learn English, you would like to travel someday. And I hope that it will be relevant to you as we learn these word groups. Let's begin. What's our first word group? 
nouns. Nouns are persons, places, things, or ideas. And the following are some examples of nouns. The first example, manners are important when traveling. The plane flew. Sarah read the signs. The Grand Canyon is a beautiful place. So, where are the nouns and what are the nouns? Well, manners here is a noun because it's an idea. Manners are important when traveling. The plane is a noun because it's a thing. Sarah is a noun because this word is a person, represents a person. And the Grand Canyon is a noun because it is a thing. It is a place and a thing. So what's our second word group? It's verbs. So verbs show action. Here are some examples of verbs in a sentence. The flight attendant talked to the passenger. I see many taxis in New York. They have been to get their passport. So we're looking for the action going on in the sentence when we look to identify verbs. So the first sentence, the action is happening from who? The flight attendant. She's talking. She did talk, right? The action in this sentence is coming from the person seeing. I see. That's the action, seeing. And the last one, they have been to get their passport. And even though this is in the past, it's the action of going just in the past. So that's what a verb is. A verb shows action. So what is our third word group? It's pronouns. And pronouns replace nouns. Some examples of pronouns are he, the man, is flying with her, the woman. Or they are checking into it, a hotel. Or it is why I travel. It represents an idea, adventure. So we'll review that. He is replacing a noun, the, the man. Remember we talked about a man is a person, place, thing, or idea. So he, the pronoun, is just replacing that uh, person. So you can speak faster. Pronouns are great like that. So he is flying with her. The woman. Her is also a pronoun representing the woman, the noun, the woman. So instead of saying the man is flying with the woman, you can just say he is flying with her. Much quicker, right? So that's all these, uh, these word groups represent. They represents a group of people, more than one. They are checking into it, a hotel. So they, instead of saying that group of people every single time, you can just say they. They, the pronoun, replaces the noun, those people, are checking in to it, a hotel. So you can say they are checking into the hotel, or you can say, they are just checking into it, meaning the hotel. The hotel is the noun, right? It represents the noun, or replaces the noun, actually. Uh, both of those. 
Now it, down here we looked at earlier, it, the, this pronoun it, uh, represents and replaces the idea of adventure. And adventure is an idea that is, remember, a noun. Nouns can be ideas. So adventure is an idea. Adventure is why I travel. Or you can just say, it is why I travel. And those are pronouns. Word group? It's adjectives. Adjectives describe a noun or a pronoun. Here are some examples. Colorado has a gorgeous mountain range. It's describing. Mount Rushmore shows four U.S. presidents. I am happy I drove here. So, we're looking for the part of the sentence that describes the noun or the pronoun, right? So, if we find um, some uh, nouns, then that will help us find our adjectives. So, Colorado has gorgeous mountain, a gorgeous mountain range. So, a mountain range is a group of mountains. So, it's uh, it's being described as gorgeous, as beautiful. It is describing it. So I'm using my green marker here, and maybe that'll help you remember. You know, green is a color, and it connects to describing things. When you describe something or use an adjective, you use colors. Or you use uh, what something looks like in appearance. For the second example, Mount Rushmore shows four U.S. presidents. Well, this is describing the number of presidents that you see on Mount Rushmore. So that's another descriptor for your adjective. So your adjective is four. Mount Rushmore shows four U.S. presidents. On the first one, Colorado has gorgeous, a gorgeous mountain range. So the adjective we know is gorgeous. It's describing the mountain range. Four is describing Mount Rushmore. The third example here, I am happy I drove here. I am happy. Happy is describing the noun, the pronoun. I am happy. I is the pronoun, which we learned last time is replacing the noun. So. Adjectives also describe emotions. They describe all kinds of things. Adjectives are great words uh, because they make our stories and our reading so much more colorful. So those are adjectives. Well, our next word group is adverbs. The adverbs describe a verb an adjective or another adverb. So we talked about adjectives last time describing nouns. Adverbs describe verbs, adjectives, or another adverb. Now I know this is may seem a little confusing so we're going to look at some examples and then we're going to do another little bit of examples because this gets a little um, uh, more in-depth. But I know you can do this, so don't give up, okay? So here's the example. That cake looks good. The adverb here is good. Why? Because it is describing or modifying looks, the verb. Uh, not the cake. The adverb good is describing what the cake looks like. It looks good. We don't know what the cake tastes like, but we know what it looks like. So looks is the verb that good, the adverb, is describing. So let's look at another example. The tour group followed excitedly. So, 
we're looking for verbs or adjectives or adverbs. But we're just going to stick with verbs right now. In this sentence, we know that verbs, we learn, those are action words. So followed is the action word in this sentence, right? So we found verb. We found the verb. Now, excitedly is describing the action. The tour group is following. They're excited. You've been an exciting tour group before, right? So this, this word excitedly is an adverb that's describing the, the verb follow or followed, okay? It's not describing the noun, this noun phrase tour group, uh, or, or group actually. So, next example. My elderly neighbor seems well. So, we're not looking for nouns here, we're looking for verbs for the adverb to describe, to modify, or to modify, right? My elderly neighbor, well, we've got neighbor here. Elderly is not a noun. Seems is a verb. So seems is being modified or described with this adverb, well. She seems well. Okay, so seems is the verb. And well is the adverb. Well is what's describing the verb. Now, we're going to go to a new board here in a second that will give you a list of a lot of adverbs. So don't become uh, too discouraged in, in just this part here. I hope that helps. But before we go there, I'm going to remind you uh, again that adverbs answer the question, answer the questions, how, how often, when, and where. If you can remember these questions, adverbs are usually helping us understand uh, what's going on there with some action in, um, in a sentence. Okay? How, how often, when, and where. I said I'd remind you but I just told you. So now I'm reminding you again and I'll remind you in just a moment. So, continuing with the word group adverbs, we said that if you can use the questions how, how often, when, and where, you're going to be able to find out where the adverb is in the sentence that you're looking at or listening to. Um, remember, we said adverbs describe verbs, adjectives, and other adverbs. Okay? It's important to remember. Now, if we start with how, adverbs answer the question how. Uh, we, we often see that Adverbs have ly at the end, which is great. It's one of the nice, consistent things about English, although you'll see some more without ly. But if you see a word that has ly, generally it's an adverb. So, how? Well, easily. Uh, you can speak English easily. You can speak English happily or loudly, or quickly, or quietly, or sadly. Now you can't do it silently. I guess you could do it in your head. Or slowly. So those are describing uh, the action of speaking something. Okay? Uh, and how? How is that going? Are you doing it easily, or loudly, or quickly? Things like that. The next question is how often? Adverbs, ad adverbs answer the question, how often? Always? Every day? Frequently? Never? Often? Once? Seldom? Sometimes? And this is just a, a short list, okay? But this kind of answers that question. How often? 
how and how often for our verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. When, after, before, when, early, now, since, soon, today, yesterday. So when, when, what, what is, uh, when did the action take place? Or when did something else happen in this sentence? And then where. Adverbs answer the question where. Away. Everywhere. Here. Home. Inside. Near. Outside. There. So you will see these words, <clears throat> particularly some of these, and you will think, well, isn't that another word group, another part of speech in English? Well, it depends upon what it's describing in the sentence. So I hope that helps you. And <clears throat> so that is a summary of adverbs. I recommend you maybe take a screenshot of this. This is not my original um, list, but you can take a screenshot of it and maybe look for these words in sentences when you read, and then you can uh, see how these words are being used and if they are being used as adverbs. Okay. It's conjunctions. The conjunctions join words and phrases or clauses. They're, they're connectors. They're like puzzle pieces. So let's look at a couple examples. We traveled by train and by bus. The, the and connects the train and the bus. Okay? I paid a deposit because <clears throat> I wanted to reserve a, a room. You can go to the museum or go to the park. Other common conjunctions are but, for, nor, yet, so, because, while, until, although, and if. <clears throat> There's a lot of connecting going on in language, right? Now the question you might have is, should you begin a sentence with a conjunction since they're connecting ideas, uh, clauses, words, or phrases? Well, this is a bit debated. Um, my response to that would be <clears throat> save your usages of conjunctions for the beginning of a sentence when you really want to be emphatic. Um, for example, if you say, but I paid a deposit, so I should get this room, if you didn't get the room. But usually, you would use conjunctions in the inside of sentences, at least that's just the safest way to do that. So <clears throat> to review, a conjunction is words that join words or phrases or clauses. So AND here is joining train and bus. They're actually joining by train and by bus. They're joining these two prepositional phrases which we will talk about. But uh, so that is the function of the conjunction. I paid a deposit because I wanted to reserve a room. You see this conjunction is important. It explains why but it also just connects these ideas. And the last one, uh, you can go to the museum or to the park. Gives you a couple options there. <clears throat> so there's little words that uh, do a lot of uh, describing. And they're words you need to know if you want to understand English and if you want to be understood when you speak English. So I would recommend going online, finding a list of conjunctions and seeing how uh, they function, how they work in sentences 
when you use them or when you read them. Okay? Oh, can you guess our seventh word group? It's prepositions. So, prepositions show the relationship of a noun or a pronoun to another part of the sentence. It hooks, okay, this is a hook, they hook nouns onto a sentence. They're great. I love prepositions. The luggage bin, here's an example, the luggage bin on an airplane is above my head. So, the preposition here, there's two. On an airplane and above my head. Well, on is the preposition and above is the preposition. It describes the relationship of the noun or pronoun to another part of the sentence. Another example. The ferry boat ticket is on the table. It's on the table. On is the preposition. We walked across the square. It showed the relationship of the elements in the sentence to one another. The best way I can uh, explain this, or has been explained to me, is with a scarf. Or you can think of a belt for, for, you, for you guys. You know, wear scarves. Uh, a scarf can be uh, around me, around my neck. Around is a preposition. It can be over my head. It can be on my head. It can, uh, it can be in between my fingers. Mm? Uh, it can be near me, near me. It can be beside me. It can be below me. Uh, so it, it's just a, a spatial thing. So that's what a preposition is. Prepositions, uh, hopefully you can see, prepositions don't work alone. They can't just be on or above. They have to be on something or above something or near something. So as an example, if I uh, put my book in a suitcase, the preposition is in, and it's the book is in the suitcase. Now, in a second, I'll show you this idea of a prepositional phrase, because you can't really just have a preposition. They don't like to be alone. In fact, they can't be alone. Prepositions need uh, nouns around them. So we'll look at some prepositional phrases, okay? We talked about prepositions. And prepositions show where things are, uh, but they're always connected to a noun. So I talked about my scarf. Um, the, the noun is the scarf. It's a thing, right? And the scarf is over my head. The noun, the scarf, is over the preposition, my head, which is another noun. Um, so they're connected to nouns. And they don't work alone. We talked about that, right? They need to have some friends nearby creating a prepositional phrase. Uh, they work in a group of words um, and you can identify them all the time. Remember, they're, hook, they're hooking um, uh, nouns onto a sentence. So we need prepositions to hook the noun onto the sentence. A pre prepositional phrase begins with a preposition and ends with a noun. Like I said earlier, I put my book in the suitcase, okay? I put my book in the suitcase. So if it begins with the preposition, in is the preposition, the suitcase is the noun. And so this entire phrase, in 
the suitcase is a prepositional phrase. Another example, uh, can you think of one? Um, it's uh, another way we use to be more descriptive in our, in our speech and in our writing. I took notes during the lecture. <clears throat> Maybe you went to a lecture on some place that you traveled to during the lecture. During the lecture is the prepositional phrase. Um, during is, is a little bit harder to understand because it's a it's not um, a spatial idea, uh, 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 but it is a time um, concept. So, during the lecture. During is a preposition. So, that's just a brief explanation of prepositional phrases. So, I, I hope that helps you identify them when you see them in writing or speaking. Well, our eighth part of speech in English is interjections. So interjections are used to express strong emotions, right? This person's mad, or really sad, or really happy. Um, strong emotions. For example, rats, I hurt my foot. Or great work, we won. Or, excuse me, I need to catch my plane. So they're expressing intense emotions. Another uh, group of words that fall under the category of interjections might be ahem, uh, meaning I want to speak now, or good grief, kind of frustration, or even bless you um, after you sneeze. Um, or sometimes we say bingo, meaning you got it right, bingo. Um, so these are just words that are used to express strong emotions. And I want to interject congratulations. You've just finished the video that talks about the eight parts of speech in the English language. Good job. I want to thank you for watching, and if you like this video, hit subscribe and leave a comment below. This is Jan at Learn English with B Global, and today we're going to be looking at how to improve your English writing skills. Specifically, we're going to be talking about an academic paper, um, not an email that you're writing to your friends or family. Um, we're going to talk about some good writing habits that you can form, and then we'll give you some tips for writing an actual paper. All right. So we'll start off with the first habit, and that is journaling. Um, journaling comes easy to some people, but for other people it's kind of a hard discipline. Um, but if you do this every day, I think that you will start to see some of the benefits of the multitasking aspect of journalism. Uh, of journaling. So for those of us who feel like journaling is kind of a waste of time, uh, it helps to keep in mind that writing in English will help you improve your writing as you're just trying to express your thoughts regarding what's important to you. Um, and like I said, if you love multitasking like me, here are some things you can do to improve your English writing skills when you journal 
each day, even if it's just for 15 minutes. When you journal, check your spelling. Uh, develop into an expert speller uh, while you're journaling. Then you don't have to look up words so often and you can save time. Uh, the other thing is to bulk up on your vocabulary. Now, I've, I've uh, drawn a little vocab man here. He's, he's really bulky and if you think about him, um, you want to have really strong vocabulary and you want to be able to flex your vocabulary muscles. So how do you do that? Well, if you haven't already made good friends with a thesaurus, um, it, the time is now. The, the thesaurus is wonderful for helping you bulk up on your vocabulary. Um, you want to be able to find words to express what you think is important uh, more than the words you would normally be using. So this journaling practice is a good time to kind of look some of those words up. There's another resource that's called a collocation and we will talk about that in a moment. I will, I will describe that but that is also a resource for bulking up your vocabulary. Okay so let's talk about collocations. So that's just a big word and all it means is it's a group of words that usually go together in spoken English or written English. Some examples of a collocation are building blocks, bright idea, talk freely, or heavy rain. Um, I suggest you add these phrases to your bulking up of your vocabulary um, because you will be able to communicate better if you understand that English speakers use collocations all the time and with very specific ways. So, one of the uh, one of the examples I used was building blocks. Okay, so when I say a collocation is a building block of how we speak English, uh, how we speak in English, um, you can know that those two words normally go together or often go together. You, you won't hear building squares or building sticks, you'll hear building blocks. Um, so, uh, a building block, the definition is, uh, it means that parts come together and make it possible for something bigger to exist. So, these collocations come together and they make up um, a, a lot of the English language, a lot. Um, so you can probably find a word and connect it to another word um, almost every time. So let's look at this other example down here of heavy rain. Uh, heavy rain is something we say in English. Uh, you could describe a lot of rain by saying big rain or uh, strong rain and you would be okay in saying that. Um, but they don't really fit into the English speaker's mind. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me if you say big rain. There's no category for that. We just say heavy rain. If it rained a lot, we said, well, it's heavy rain. For example, uh, I might say to my husband, uh, it looks like we had heavy rain last night because the yard is still very wet. All right, so that's how we would use that. So that's a collocation. So I would invest in a hard copy of a collocations dictionary if you can. Or you may want to uh, go to a library and just take a look at it and see what it looks like and see if it can help you and if you can use that when you're writing your papers. There may also be some online resources for collocations that you can find as well.
But I, I think this is a, a nice tip for improving your English writing skills and also your spoken English. <clears throat> so again, why use collocations to bulk up your English vocabulary? Um, well, it expedites learning English as opposed to just learning vocabulary in single words. So that's when you're writing in your journal. Remember, you want to use a thesaurus or use a, a collocation dictionary. You want to check your spelling, become an expert at checking your spelling. And then <clears throat> also, when you write in your journal, practice writing in the present tense. Um, and that helps uh, you to have active verbs. And uh, when you do that, when you describe whatever happened in your day when you write in the journal, Try to find some attention-grabbing verbs. Uh, the fourth thing you can do, you can multitask while you're uh, doing your journal writing, is to make your sentences short. Um, short sentences um, show that you know what you're saying. Um, I've edited a lot of papers, I've written a lot of papers <laughs> that have been edited, and one way you can make your teacher, your editor happy is write short sentences. Don't, don't try to write a big long sentence unless you're absolutely sure uh, you know where you're going with that. And even native English writers and speakers, we, we try to uh, be as concise as possible. So short sentences make what you're trying to express very clear. In addition to journaling, another habit you might uh, get into, if you aren't already, is reading on a regular basis. You can read newspaper articles for examples of brevity, of short sentences. I also recommend reading some good books with great descriptions. That's another way to bulk up your vocabulary, to learn how they're saying things. What adjectives are they using? Right now, I am rereading Anne of Green Gables. And uh, the description and the overall vocabulary is just delightful. Um, and it sharpens my mind. It helps me be a better communicator and a better writer. So I recommend reading um, various types of writers as you're trying to uh, increase your English writing skills. Okay, so what if you get an assignment to write an academic paper? Um, how do you write a good paper? Um, one of the most common academic papers is the research paper. So we're going to use that as our example today. What do you do first? Well, the first thing you need to do is find a topic, right? Find a topic. Um, you often get a choice uh, in your paper's topic, so finding the topic that interests you will make the writing process so much more fun and enjoyable. So, if you don't know where to start with this topic search, um, you can always just go online and just uh, search, find a topic. Well, there are quite bit of interesting issues out there upon which to write. So once you've found your topic, we don't want to make it too broad, right? That's our second point. We've all tried to write papers with a topic that is too extensive and then later discovered after a lot of unnecessary research that we should have narrowed our focus. So we're going to look at some samples of how to narrow your focus. Say, for example, you uh, want to write, you like to write about writers in Ireland. So maybe your, your topic is writers in Ireland. Uh, that's way too big, right? So you could instead do something like, Oscar Wilde's Last Day. So it's a lot smaller um, thing for you to research and write. Um, another uh, 
thing you may want to write about are big cats in Indonesia. Too big, too big. Uh, how about instead the daily life of the Sumatran tiger? That's small enough for you to write a paper, and me too, right? Or uh, you're interested in archaeology, archaeology in the Middle East. Okay, that's a little, that's a little bit more focused, but it's still way too big, right? I mean, it's archaeology. Instead, how about, why is the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls so important in 2015? Okay, so that's, I think you get the picture with that. We want to just um, have a topic that is manageable. All right, so we've chosen our topic, and we've narrowed it. And the third thing you need to do when you're writing a research paper is to create your purpose statement, or some people call it a thesis statement, but we'll just say it's a purpose statement that seems to communicate uh, more clearly. A purpose statement is just the main idea of what you want to say. It keeps everything else in your paper back directed to the main point, your big idea. Knowing your big idea at the start, writing it down, will save you time when you edit at the end. Think of your purpose statement as the trunk of a tree. Everything else that you write about in your paper should naturally connect to the trunk of the tree. Uh, maybe that helps. Uh, so with the Oscar Wilde example I gave before, your purpose statement might be, uh, this paper will explore why Oscar Wilde was surprisingly remorseful of his life choices at the end of his life. Now, I know I said before we want to keep our sentences short, uh, and we need to do that. The purpose statement is saying a lot, so it's really something you need to work on at the beginning. It may not be as short um, <clears throat> as other ones, but your purpose statement needs to have something interesting in it. It, um, it even needs to be, some might say, it needs to be debatable. Um, you're not going to say, the sky is blue. And no, one, no one's going to read that. But if you write something like, Oscar Wilde was remorseful at the end of his life, this, this party guy, uh, I want to read this paper because I want to know if it's true or not. So that's, that's kind of the idea. And once you've done that, you've got it right here, like on your trunk, and you're committed to that idea. So you need to decide what idea you want to commit to. And then everything else in your paper is to surround and support that idea. So, pick a topic and narrow the topic. Then write a purpose statement. What are you trying to say in your paper? Then you have these supporting limbs uh, and leaves that are around there, and those are your evidences. And you know, you can cut some of them out or you can add some more, but you still have your purpose statement. So I hope that gives you an idea of why the purpose statement is important. And I hope it's fun for you. Don't don't look at it as something negative because then eh, you won't like to do it. <laughs> so if you don't have a purpose statement and you only have these ideas, there's no trunk, then they're just a bunch of thoughts, evidences lying on the ground. There's no cohesion there and you really want cohesion in your papers. Your teachers want you to have cohesion as well. Um, our fourth tip is, uh, is to make an outline before you start. Um, you need to know it's, it's helpful to know which branches you want to stick on the tree. 
what evidences support what you're saying, what examples you want to use to support your purpose statement. So having an outline before you start will help you so much. So making an outline is really just creating a template for yourself that you can just fill in. So it feels like a little less work in that, in that way. Um, of course you're going to need to have a conclusion and you're going to have to work on a solid conclusion as well. Um, but the final uh, tip I have for you is to always edit your paper before you submit it. And maybe you think that's obvious, but I know a lot of people who write their papers late into the night, they turn it in, nobody looks at it, and they could have had a really great paper if they just had started earlier and um, had someone look at it. So we have a saying in the US uh, and it goes like this, get a second pair of eyes. So what does that mean? Well it means uh, always have some other person's eyes look at your paper before you submit it. Or your blog, eh, maybe. Um, of course uh, it helps if this second pair of eyes, this other person, uh, is um, a good English writer or speaker. Um, but I've also heard that there are some free online web pages that are willing to do some uh, free corrections for you. So that's something to investigate as well. And I would take advantage of that. Sometimes it's easier to have someone you don't know edit your paper, right? Um, I know having someone proofread or edit your final paper can be time consuming and maybe feel painful, but uh, remember they're, they're not editing you, they're editing your paper. So with editing, you're going to have to plan ahead, um, as I mentioned before. As soon as you get your assignment, I would start writing down ideas and notes. If you wait until the last minute to write your paper, then no one is going to edit your paper in, in the short amount of time. Um, it's good to plan ahead with that. So I'm going to give you another eye idiom for free. It's called fresh eyes. And uh, what we will say is we look at a paper with fresh eyes. Well, what does that mean? Uh, well, once you write your paper, the best advice I ever got was write your draft, put it aside, uh, go do something, take a nap. The best thing is just to sleep. Uh, I mean, just let it let it cool overnight is what we would say. And then in the morning when you go back to it, you look at it with fresh eyes. Uh, eyes that are not tired, eyes, eyes that can see simple mistakes that would maybe make a difference in the grade. Or So having fresh eyes when you look at your paper uh, will maybe make a difference between an A and a B or something like that. Um, so get a second pair of eyes, have them look, someone else look at your paper, and also edit your paper with a fresh pair of eyes uh, yourself. So those are some of my top tips for how you can improve your English writing skills. And I know you will do great. Thank you for watching. And if you like this video, hit subscribe and leave a comment below.